Welcome to uh, another Wednesday class. If you haven't seen our, our other videos, we have them all posted on YouTube. Um, it's youtube.com slash Christian Ross. Um, and I think we've we've got some really great videos out there. And they're yep. supposed to be kind of the idea is that they're one topic each generally. And that makes it pretty easy to digest. If it's something that's interesting to you, you can easily go to it and find it. And if it's not something you're interested in, you can skip it. So if you haven't looked at the YouTube videos yet, that might be a really good option. Alternatively, we send out articles every Sunday. Usually it's every Sunday. And we kind of either piggyback on the videos or we kind of talk about an entirely different topic. It, we kind of just have to see where the inspiration comes from. And Dad, you and I have talked about this at length, but you know, some people have asked us, where do we get our inspiration on these videos and where the topics come from. It just right. comes from coming to work, right? Three o'clock in the morning. There's some Three deal that the morning, stuff. coming to work, um, basically, you know, going through these deals. You see it once and you think, okay, well, let's not do that again. And yes. um, and we jump right into, all right, well, let's hope that other people don't have the same problem. Well, I mean, the, the beauty is we, we get exposed to so many different issues by virtue of our affiliation with the uh, real estate brokerage firm. So yeah. it's not just stuff that flows through this office. We get the stuff that all the realtors yeah. at Downing Cry get. Anything that flows across yeah. the path. Yeah, we'll stuff. see. And it's kind of a neat way you built the business this way. And I've, I've, kind of modeled myself the same exact manner but we want people to feel that they can reach out to us and ask questions yeah. whether it's related to the, a closing that we're doing or it's something on a personal level if it's something we can help if we have the time to help we would love to it's a it's our way of kind of kind of being involved in the community it's are you giving like, back you yeah, back it, and for a lot of times it's a pro bono type of approach to it where we're not looking at a clock. If we can help, we want to. And if it makes some, if it makes someone's day, if it makes it a lot easier, we, you know, we would welcome that. So please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, and so the inspiration of this class comes from uh, the multiple phone calls I'll get from very experienced agents saying, "Hey, I just don't do far bar very often. I usually stick to neighbor, or I, you know, I'm new to the area, or whatever it may be." So I wanted to kind of dive into let, how do you make an offer on a far bar contract? How would we think about it? Let's see if we can kind of make it seem less intimidating. And, um, you know, we'll see if it works. I, I think it helps me knowing, all right, if we run through an entire contract, it's not that intimidating. But there are a couple of things that we want you to pay attention, a couple of those issues that we always want to pinpoint. And we can use that cla this class for that. Um, all right, let me see if I can share my screen. Here we go. Okay, so we had a choice, obviously. We could pick the um, the sales contract with the repair language in it, or you could use an as is. And I've said this before, that's actually pretty helpful because it works the same way that Nabor does. You've got two types, you know, the standard and the as is. So, right. you know, we're already making progress here. And this is this is the application that we use, but obviously um, you might use app files or some other um, uh, electronic form, and, and you can you can add in all the names. That's pretty straightforward. You're gonna actually you know you're gonna describe the property, and then this part, the legal description is. So I know we've done this before, but why don't I show you where I get the legal description from is specifically for this portion. So if we go on here and we just pick, um, this is not our property. This is not someone who's related to us, but this is what I would do. I would just copy and paste this legal. Now this is what you would call like a short legal description. It is not the full legal description. It's not sufficient for transferring title on a warranty deed. But for sales purposes, this is perfect. When you use a contract, you see how easy it was? I copied and pasted and I put it right into the contract. 
And uh, actually, even the street address or the tax ID number, as long as it's identifiable for the contract, not, not for the deed. That's right. That's right. Um, so, you you know, they give you these areas. If we want, I would I would highly recommend do the address, do the tax ID and then that legal description. Just use the short one. Um, let's see if I can pull another one. Again, this is not someone that we're related to, but this is the Lee County property appraiser website. They have the same. Uh, it looks like it's they're having technical difficulties. All right, here we go. Uh, property description. Let's see if they have a legal description in here. They may not. Where do they keep it? Oh, here it is. It's just this right here. Right. So you would just take that and you'd paste that into your legal description instead of what we had. So that's the first thing. That was pretty good. We're already making even more progress. Yeah. Easy enough. The next thing we have is personal property. So you're noticing it's it matching. It's matching what your neighbor contract experience is like so far. Um, what do we usually recommend, Dad, regarding personal property items? Because uh, well, we have these so, kind of standard items in here, like a range, an oven, refrigerator, yeah. dishwasher. The washer and dryer aren't there. And the neighbor contract has a lot of personal property that's not here, like home entertainment systems, home security systems, things like that. So I always point this out to the sellers and buyers, just in case there's something the seller plans on taking with them. You know, certain Perfect. family Love heirloom. Uh, this is uh, I'm now sharing the uh, neighbor contract. So you would look here. Yeah, see, look at they have the audio visual home entertainment system, and I always yeah. use me as an example. If you know I signed a contract and I didn't understand it, and I'm, I'm conveying my stereo, I'd be pretty ticked at the realtor. At this point. yeah, and a lot no. of times we see that a a seller isn't isn't looking so closely at this. Obviously a buyer may not be looking that closely, but it it makes sense that if there's gonna be a disagreement about whether it's supposed to convey, you want it in the contract. You wanna well, make look, sure- We've got a built-in home generator. Those things are quite expensive. Um, yeah. Pool, you want solar cover, child pool, safety fence, those things are removable. So if, if you wanted that to stay, you wanna make sure that you put that into your contract. So you put here, um, let's say we just copy and we paste that in there. And now I'm good. Now I'm happy. Um, yeah. And then this part, I always want to make sure a listing agent is asking this question. And this is no matter what the contract is, is, hey, what's not staying? Now, there's an easy way to fix this. And that's making sure it's out of the property before you even list. If it's not supposed to stay, just get it out of there. Don't have it be in the MLS pictures. Um, don't list it under, you know, things that are staying. Don't even go there. But if you had to, you know, I've seen, um, I saw one where there was a, a stained glass window uh, in the bathroom. And so that's not being included in the purchase. Now, in that scenario, you may want to add that, you know, the seller is going to replace it with a standard window or something like that. But that could be a uh, family heirloom or something of that. Exactly. Sort. I actually had a deal where the front door was like 250 years old. They bought it, you know, they, they inherited it and they, that was definitely not staying, but guess what? The buyer didn't know that. And so they, um, they basically had to give a lot of money to the buyer until the buyer got happy because there was no way the seller was going to leave it, but the buyer actually cared that it was there. They loved it. So yeah. that was a tough one to like stomach after the fact. If you're negotiating it up front and the buyer knows that this was the seller's mother's chandelier, for example, they're usually pretty uh, flexible on that. Yeah. Now, uh, going back, someone mentioned in the comments that it's typical that a um, that you would you would actually use the legal description in the deed, which is absolutely correct. Um, let me go back to this form here. Um, and I was just giving you the quick and easy solution for a sales contract. But if you wanted to, you could click this button and it will pull up the deed. And he, so here's our deed. And Lee County has the exact same thing. This is the full legal description. That is what we would use on a deed. So if you wanted to, you could type that whole thing out and include it into your sales contract. What I'm suggesting, though, is that you probably don't have to do that. You could you could do something a little bit simpler and just copy and paste the short legal. Save yourself maybe 20 minutes of of writing it down. I'd be afraid of a mistake. You miss one thing on that legal. 
Um, yeah. And, and um, maybe a mistake's not a huge deal, with, but only in the event that you did all of these. You put the address, you put the county, you put the parcel ID, right. and then you made a mistake on the legal. Then you're probably okay because it's fairly clear as to what you're conveying. Um, yeah. The trick I usually see is you can't necessarily pull the legal if it was from a, um, you know, a, a subdivision. Um, you know, maybe it, maybe the your seller bought it from Lennar and they haven't updated the legal. You can't include the whole legal. You know, so you have to make sure that you you're reading what is being conveyed. Are they splitting it? Are they doing something less or more than what's listed on the tax website? Um, this part I'm not going to do over overdo. Uh, but you've got your purchase price, you've got your first deposit, you've got your second deposit. The one thing you'll see different here is that you list the escrow agent name on the first page. Nabor Contract has it on the last page. Um, pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Uh, you're going to put in when the additional deposit is due. Now, Dad, you and I did a class last week on the difference between the deposits and remedies clause on Nabor versus Farbar. On this case, you know, knowing that it's far bar, it's deposits made or agreed to be made is potential remedies. So line eight right there. Yep. So we're what line is it, Dad? Line thirty line thirty-eight. Oh there it it's is. In front right of there. Line thirty eight. All deposits paid or agreed to be paid are collectively referred to as the deposit. So if if the deposit is a remedy to the seller then it doesn't matter how you split up those deposits. The first one could be day one. The second one could be day 100. They're both on the line in the event your buyer were to default. Um, but it still probably makes sense to split it up where you can. Um, you've got your financing, so any loan amount. Here, you might use a seller financing. Now, Dad, what's your opinion on time limit of an offer? Do you have a um, kind of a suggestion for this? Because Personally, I'm not a big fan of putting time limits on offers. You know, each, each situation is different. I mean, if, if you're make, if you're the selling agent, you're making an offer, you know the listing agent's going to shop it with all the people they know. So if you're making a really strong offer and you know the seller's available to the listing agent, I'd make it short. I mean, I'd make it real short because you don't want the listing agent to shop it around. Yeah. Well, you're trying to create urgency. Um, yeah. Yeah. Now that can but we're looking at other properties. Long. We don't want to go through the weekend. Uh, yeah, uh, it can know, backfire on you. So I just want to be careful if if it's not a contentious or like highly, um, you know, requested property. Maybe you're the only one making an offer. Um, you can you could probably leave this blank, and it wouldn't be. But you need you need to know where the seller is too. If the seller's on vacation somewhere, you can't just give them twelve hours. Right, right. Um, and if I'm the seller, personally, I don't pay any attention to time limits. I ignore them entirely. If if I had to, I would white out entire section three as a seller because I'm going to accept it when I want to accept it. Uh, and we're most likely not accepting it without any changes anyways. I'm countering something. So I might as well just ignore the time limit. I'll get to, I'll get to it when I get to it. Um, closing date. That's pretty straightforward. Time is of the essence for closing dates. So if whatever date you put on there, um, you're going to have to hit. Um, you've got extensions for loan uh, approvals. Pretty straightforward. We're going to skip over the things that are more boilerplate. On, on the closing date, Chris, whenever I don't yeah. check, it ends up being the weekend. So I look kind of silly. You, you don't want to look unprofessional. So it's always good to pick a date. You know, look at your calendar. And, and you yeah, know, if, yeah. If I can and even to really micromanage. I try to avoid Mondays and Fridays. Yeah, it's it seems like a silly thing, and and it kind of is, but it looks more professional if you pick a it date that's on a weekday. I agree. Yeah, well, if you pick if you pick a date like on uh, the Friday Sunday. after Thanksgiving, everyone's going to kind of be a little annoyed that oh, we got our date wrong. Um, probably not the end of the world, but I I would prefer not to have a date you know that doesn't make any sense right from the beginning. Especially uh, someone, um, someone asked that I show on Lee County how to pull the deed. So Lee County, again, you've got your short legal description right there. And then if you scroll down to sales and transactions, you can click that button, wait for it to load, and you'll show it'll show the link to all the deeds. So you've got this one sold in January. Previously, it sold in, in October. 
of 2020 and then 2017 a couple of times. But if you look at the most recent deed, you, you click that link next to it and you will find your warranty deed. In this case, uh, it was a quick claim deed, putting it into an LLC. So That's you've got your full legal description right there. And you can find out if it's in a trust, what the uh, seller paid for it, how long they owned it. It's all useful information. Yep, very useful information. And if you looked, you know, it's got who the LLC is here. It has their forwarding address. Um, it's it seemed I don't know why this uh, homeowner put it into an LLC, especially when they're um, basically having mail forwarded to this exact same property. Maybe it's all, maybe it's lived in by a family member, but um, typically, <laughs> what's what's the one downside of an LLC, Dad? For yeah, can homestead it, can homestead it. Yeah, so that would be, you know, if they really are living there, which makes it seem like they are, um, probably not the best idea. In fact, I bet you they don't have homestead on here. Yeah, you want homestead if you can get it. No, this is an estimate. That's not what we wanted. So you can show the trim value. And well, it's definitely not going to be homestead because it's an LLC. I don't know where the Lee County has this stuff. All right, I'm getting ahead of myself. All right, let me go back to the form. <laughs> All right, so again, we're we're doing this in the guise of you're not used to doing a far bar. You're trying to put a contract together, and you want to make sure you're doing it right. So we're just going to kind of skim over a lot of this stuff. Just like Nabor, you've got uh, line 73. If there is a lease, you're going to be checking that box. If there is not, you'll leave it blank. Yep. And this part is different. So Nabor automatically makes the contract assignable. Uh, but in this case, you can actually change that. So buyer may assign and be released, may assign but not be released from liability, or may not assign. Uh, at all, not at least not without the seller's permission. So typically, Nabor would be this middle one, may assign yeah. but not be released. That's the one I see the most. The one right? I pick, uh, unless there's a unique situation, that that's what I would pick. Um, all right, so financing, uh, right on the form, just like in Nabor. Um, you can choose it as a cash transaction. It doesn't mean you, that you're not allowed to get a mortgage, but it means that you're not going to be protected in the event you um, can't get financing. So we'll do this as if it was a contract uh, with a mortgage. So they've got a standard 30-day uh, financing period. You could always change that. We're going to choose a conventional loan. We're going to say it's a fixed interest rate. And if you leave this blank, then the prevailing rate based on buyer's credit worthiness, I would leave it blank. Um, I don't, I personally have not liked it when a buyer tries to get out because the interest rate went up. Um, it just, it's not very genuine in my opinion. It, it's not that buyers are doing it on purpose. It's that they probably didn't lock in the, the rate early enough. They didn't have enough skin in the game to feel like, all right, I got to put my foot down yeah. and make this happen. I think if it's just a general rate, you know, if, if the prevailing rate is seven and a half right now and, and you can't get anything less than nine, then you're going to be able to get out no matter what. But if if you're getting out because you got a seven and three quarters as opposed to a seven and a half, I don't know. That's I don't like that. So I would I don't think Nabar has that prevailing rate language. But I, if I'm representing the seller, I wholeheartedly agree with you. I'd leave it blank. I would leave it blank if you can. Yeah. So if we look at, um, let's see if I can switch it over to Nabor real quick. It's got this here, this percentage rate. Um, I don't know if it says it elsewhere. It doesn't, it doesn't as far I don't as think I know. It does, but I believe there is language that says if you put market or prevailing, I don't know. I'm, we'll just go back to our far bar. We'll have to talk about that on a different one. Uh, this one, we've done uh, some articles on this before, Dad, which is buyer making an application within a certain number of days using good faith and diligent effort to obtain approval of a loan meeting, the financing and appraisal term. So that good faith and diligent effort is really important. They define it. It's line 103. And they also have a uh, provision with line 107 where the uh, the seller and the broker are supposed to keep the... Uh, but the buyer and the broker are supposed to keep the seller in form of the status of the loan application, the appraisal, loan approval, all this within the 30 day uh, default period. Yeah, exactly. Um, buyer shall upon written request, keep seller and broker fully informed, exactly. 
Uh, if within the loan period, buyer obtains a loan approval, buyer shall notify. Let, let's get to the meat and bones of this one, Dad. The big difference between Nabor and Farbar is that in Nabor, if you had 30 days and the appraisal's not done, you just don't do anything, right? If you're a buyer, right. you just right. you don't have to. You definitely don't waive your financing contingency, but you also don't really need to extend it. You, you don't just, have to do anything. They they yeah. changed this because too many deals were falling apart at the end when they got the appraisals. Uh, but what I end up telling, um, I mean, I, I I had somebody call me when I was at the airport picking up my bags the other day. I, I warned them. I said, you want to put on your calendar one week before the loan approval period expires because a lot of things happen if the seller, if the buyer does nothing. And in fact, the seller has a five day window to cancel um, after that. So they, they might want to sell it to somebody else for more money. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But just calendar one week before because there's like three things the buyer can do. Uh, and one thing the seller can do if nothing is done. Yeah. Uh, it's, well, it's, and so let's talk about that. Nothing is done if buyer fails to timely deliver any written notice um, to seller prior to expiration of loan approval period, then buyer shall proceed forward with this contract as though paragraph 8A above has been checked right. is the cash transaction. So you basically lose your financing contingency if you do nothing. Cash deal. Yeah, so that's and, pretty... And, that's and, a and huge... appraisal is out of the equation, by the way, too, because that's part of the loan approval uh, period. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so if you haven't gotten your appraisal yet, then you cannot allow a buyer to move forward without that financing contingent, unless they're willing to you know, not lose the property. If they're willing to put their deposit at risk, right. knowing that they, they would never be able to keep the deal together otherwise, you, you have to terminate. You'd have to say, hey, we're terminating because we haven't been able to get the appraisal. Um, and you'd, you know, you'd have to get something from the lender in that regard. Um, but that that is the big difference on financing contingencies between Nabor and Farbar is that expiration on a Farbar, you lose your financing contingency. And on a Nabor, it just kind of keeps going. So that's I mean, here the buyer can actually terminate if they haven't received loan approval or if they did receive loan approval. Uh, some of the conditions aren't going to be achieved before closing. So the buyer has a right to terminate, you know, within this 30 day loan approval period, which is different than neighbor. So again, I just tell realtors calendar one week before the 30 days. So we can go over the three options the buyer has. Uh, if we're on the seller side, you know, do we want to continue with this buyer or not? Cause he has a five day window to cancel. So this part's huge. This is a big difference. This is closing costs. So um, a lot of people have this, this question. This you can read with paragraph 12 to make any sense of it. Well, so the big difference with Nabor and Farbar is, is basically this mandatory repair request. And there's, yeah. there's a lot of strategy involved in this part. Um, Dad, you and I have written articles on this before. Yeah. You could, you know, what most people do, they keep it simple and they put one and a half percent on each of these. Yeah. If you have a million dollars, that adds up to theoretically forty five thousand dollars. So yeah, so that, that's pretty that's pretty big. And so the first thing I want people to realize is that it adds up. And so if you're if you explain this correctly to a seller, you're the listing agent and you say, hey, look, just so you know, if you've got a, if they find a bunch of defective items, you're responsible for the first 15 grand on a million dollar deal. And then if they find termites, there's another 15 grand. And then if they find another permit issue or uh, anything like that, there's another 15 grand. Not, you know, it's probably unlikely that you would have all of those. But yeah. in that scenario, if the if the seller really thinks they have that kind of issues with the property, let's go as is. Alternatively, Dad, you and I always suggest a different solution. We'll put zero. Yeah. Uh, and it, then leave that something, right? And then we put- Yeah, I put a dollar figure, figure for wood destroying organisms in case they find some termites. Yeah, so let's say they find termites. Let, let's say it's 10,000. And just, just put a number down that the seller is willing to pay. And then the other two categories, general repair and, and the permits, the seller has the option to exceed the zero if they find something so they can keep the buyer tied to the contract. Yeah. So, so if you were selling, this is this is exactly what I would recommend. Essentially, what this does, Dad, is it makes it an as-is contract, right? It makes it as-is for the seller. 
makes it as is for the seller. So what happens if if they find that the um, you know, there's a there's a problem with the roof and it's going to cost five thousand dollars. The seller can decide, do I want to agree to take care of that and keep the buyer in the deal or do I want to say no, thank you? And then, yeah, the and, then the, and then the buyer, if, they, if you say no, thank you, then the buyer can walk. The okay. buyer can walk and take their deposit. Right. The re, what's the what's the difference? Why do we put a number in wood destroying organisms? Why, well, why is that treated differently? I you know, my own personal theory is it's so hard to figure out if let's say a home was tented. Now, how do you know the tenting was effective? How do you know the extent of the damage to the studs, say, in the house? If it's a wood frame house. Uh, you, you don't. People have an emotional reaction to termites and wood destroying organisms, uh, and they may or may not want the property, even if the seller is willing to pay for the tenting of the house. You know, they may not like the chemicals, for example. Um, I don't. I don't want it. Um, you know, but my 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 personal theory, and I've been to a bunch of classes on this. They've never really talked about it, but that is the one anomaly in the, in this particular paragraph. Yeah, where the yeah. seller can't pay the extra. Yeah. So, um, and maybe the maybe the buyer would allow the seller to pay the extra, but we always right. want to make sure that the seller has. If I was representing a seller, yeah, the seller has that decision, not the buyer. Um, I want to maintain leverage on the transaction wherever possible. So just as a reminder, I've highlighted uh, line 156, seller shall pay such actual cost, but not in excess of applicable repair, general repair, WDL repair, and permit limits yeah. set forth above. So that is the big difference with repair items as compared to a neighbor contract. Um, someone asked, uh, just to kind of skip backwards for two seconds, if you had a financing contingency that's expiring and no appraisal yet, can you extend the contingency instead of terminating? Absolutely. Um, in fact, if I was representing a buyer, that's what I would recommend. I would say, hey, let's just extend the appraisal portion of this, you know, where in the, you know, only in the event that an appraisal doesn't come in at value, can the buyer walk away? Um, yeah. Something along those lines. But, but ultimately, if you're coming up against that deadline and the seller's not playing ball, you need to terminate. You'll need to take I mean, it off. We've had this, Christian. We've had this where the deal oh, turned yeah. to a cash deal and the, and the buyer didn't know. Yeah. Uh, and you just don't know. I mean, if I was in the same position, um, a house that I was buying, I would have to be the one making that decision. I would have to be, as the buyer, am I willing to risk my deposit or not? Exactly. Um, so cost to be paid. The other parts on this that is interesting is obviously um, people are aware that Farbar treats some of the costs a little bit differently, but it's not really in a lot of this part of the contract. So you've got costs to be paid by the seller, including doc stamps on the deed, uh, title search charges, if and, and owner's title only if something below is is picked. But if we keep going down, we look at costs to be paid by the buyer, taxes and recording fees on the note and mortgage. All up until that point, everything is right. You know, buyers paying for their own survey. They're paying for any lender costs, HOA condo association fees. Again, this still matches everything on a neighbor contract. Here's right. where it's different. Seller shall designate closing agent and pay for owner's title policy. That would be box number one. Or buyer shall designate closing agent and pay for owner's policy and charges. So that's a big difference for us is that you actually choose who's going to pay you for the title policy. I kind of like that. What do you think, Doug? Well, versus neighbor, where if it's Lee County, and that's what we're talking about here, the 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 uh, seller pays, but the buyer selects the closing agent. And that and that rubs a lot of people the wrong way. Uh, yeah, like so that's a that's better. a good distinction. So if you do a Lee County deal, just automatically, there's no check boxes. Neighbor would say. The seller is going to pay for it, but the buyer still gets to choose who does the closing. Um, and then yeah. here, they they just don't do that. They say, oh, "Wait, you." Can I, I like this a lot. I mean, sometimes we have the buyer paying because you know it's a, it's a large property and there's going to be a lot of legal services. And if it's a large deal, uh, we, we get paid out of the title insurance premium, and we don't charge the attorney's fee in many cases. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, the buyer or the buyer might have plans for the property and they, and they want us looking at the restrictive covenants. They want more than just the title analysis. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, you know, if you if you were able to negotiate for the seller to pay for title and the closing and all those costs, then you could always have your buyer hire us to just do a review to sure. you know, consult for them directly. And, and so really you're looking at it from what is the best deal for my client where they're still getting some service, they're still getting protected. Um, the right. things that I don't like is when the seller is trying to force you to use their closing agent for a title reason, for some issue that might be there. I want to make sure a buyer is pretty protected in that regard. You um, I also sure. don't like it when there's a title company that's way out of town and that's going to cause uh, an inconvenience to the buyer where they're going to have to pay to come and sign with their local title company. So just be thoughtful about it. But at the end of the day, if this if the seller is going to pay a $10,000 closing fee bill, take the money. Take the money. You can always supplement it with hiring us directly. We tend to have more difficulty with title companies way out of town. They they they, they don't really care about returning phone calls. Yeah, yeah. and they we're don't... not immune to that either. I mean, if no. we're doing a deal in Tallahassee, it might be a challenge for us to know kind of yeah. the differences. Now, the nice thing about it is we know far bar contracts. We know how it's supposed to work. Um, so we could get up to speed pretty quickly in that regard. But um, you still, you know, you've got, again, we'll we'll keep rolling through this. Uh, and by the way, keep these questions coming. I love that you guys are giving us feedback. You speak the special the assessments, Christian. You, you know, the seller can pay your summons up to the closing and the buyer pay after. Lines yeah, it, which I love. I really like this. Again, kind of goes to the idea of why can't we just designate how we're handling this? Why does it have to be one one way or the highway. Yeah. So this would be for um, the full amount of liens imposed by public body, which does not include the condo and HOA. So um, I believe like Benita Springs has some sewer uh, liens on the properties. You know, they've, Mark Weiland had that for a while, right, dad? Yeah, they had an $18,000 uh, um Lean yeah. So what you would do is you would, it would be paid on your tax bill every year and then and over time it would shrink it down. And so what we want to do is we want to allocate. All right. How are we going to handle this going forward? Because if it's if it's four hundred dollars or if it's four thousand uh, dollars, we want to make sure we know who's paying for it up until closing or is the buyer going to assume it after closing? Mm -hmm. um, and so you, a lot of times you will see something like this. Seller shall pay installments due prior and buyer shall pay installments due after. Installments prepaid or due for the year of closing shall be prorated. I think that's great unless you negotiated with the seller to say, no, 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 no. I want a clean bill. Um, I want the seller to just take care of it, have it be paid for. That's what was advertised on the MLS. Be done. Um, now, the interesting part, line 216, this paragraph shall not apply to a special benefit tax lien imposed by a community development district. So CDD, um, that's done separately. Um, those are done uh, as a proration, according to standard K. So um, you just have to be careful. You've got public body liens. You've got your CDD right. or MST, MTSU, MSTU. And then you've got your HOA and condo associations. Um, again, let's keep rolling. All the disclosure stuff. You know, one thing that I'm noticing here, Dad, is this okay. this line here on mold, because we didn't really talk about mold. Oh, they just tell you mold's bad. Mold's <laughs> bad, yeah. So now when we looked at those um, repair items, mold was not included. Radon was not included. Mold, mold and radon is not a general repair item, and that's paragraph 12. We haven't gotten there yet. We haven't gotten there yet. So mold's naturally occurring. If buyer's concerned or desires... Additional information buyers should contact an appropriate professional. See Rider I, mold inspection. So if you want to add a mold inspection to your contract, Rider I will be the thing for I, you. I don't like Rider I. Uh, Rider I is, if anything, if you have mold remediation over $500, the buyer has the right to terminate. That's the default amount. And and you can, if you can't find $500 worth of mold remediation in any house on Marco Island, I'll buy you lunch. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. It's I mean, there's, there's, like you said, work, there's, there's your air handler. There's always mold somewhere. Right, right. I love that. Um, you know, yeah. I think if you have a buyer, and dad, you and I have talked about this a lot. If you have a buyer who's from out of town or just someone that would be pretty concerned about mold and radon, which is understandable, 
um, the as is contract is still going to be a great option for you. It's it's why we keep going back to that to say, look, we're not trying to argue which rider to use. And is that repair item limit enough? It's not about that. It's about yeah. an as is contract gives the buyer a fair shake at doing an inspection and deciding for themselves if they want to stay or they want to go. Um, all right, we got a little question. I probably did something. Is there a mold and radon form for far bar? There is. There's rider I for mold, and then I think radon There's nothing has one. Radon stuff. that I'm aware of. Um, there may not. We'll look for those riders. We'll go through those. But you need to know that's missing from general repair items so that we can come up with something for you. Because yeah, or, or you know, a, lot, a lot of deals up in Lee County are just the as is contract, so we can deal with it that way too. Yeah, and so if you're if you're new into the area and you're not used to far bar contracts, let's keep it simple. Do an as is contract. That as is as is as is. If you're using a standard, then you're going to call us anyways. But again, this is supposed to kind of demystify, um, you know, how hard yeah. this may or may when not be. When I got be. called at the airport, Christian, and then the, the realtor was making an offer in Lee County, what form to use? I said, uh, far bar as is, yeah. and warned them about the finance clause. You need to calendar one week before the loan approval period. Uh, All right. And- so next thing on here is the inspection period. The mm. big difference here um, is that there's no election period. So you neighbor to... has your inspection period and then an additional five days for elections. Farbar doesn't have that. So nope. again, it kind of it's similar to like the financing distinctions where they're there. They're, they're easy. You just have to realize where you could get tripped up a little bit. So if you do all your inspections and on day 12, you submit your uh, repair request, you missed it. And I wouldn't want you to do that. So it's it's not about drafting the contract. It's about understanding it and educating your client as best as possible on these items. It has some interesting differences. Like it talks about fogged windows and neighborhood doesn't specifically talk about fogged windows. Yeah. And your client probably wouldn't know the distinction between neighbor and far bar. So I would definitely push them to go over this sort of stuff. You know, property condition is listed pretty well here. In fact, when we're going over neighbor contracts, we tend to use some of the far bar examples as examples for us to say whether it's cosmetic or not, because they really get into it. Um, oh. I, I like this form. It's not that it would it's 100 percent you know, exact and we can use it, but it, it's a good guide. You know, well, the good thing about this form, Christian, is it's more case law relating to this form because it's used throughout the state. Right, right. It, there's a lot more case law on, on this. You need a and case to, you know. That's the yeah. other reason why we want as is, because we don't want a bunch of cases on this. That means no, that there are people no. getting in fights over it. We want people to close and be happy. That's right. Yes, exactly. Um, we have, So this is somewhat similar to Nabor, where you're kind of describing uh, defective a items in cosmetic. Clause in we can skip over that probably. What was that? We This has a force majeure. Nabor does not. Yeah, we have not gotten to that yet. Okay. Um, repair standards. Again, you, nothing you're going to need to fill out at this point. Um, professional advice, nothing you need to fill out there. Buyer and seller defaults. Yeah, so again, on this one, if the buyer defaults. We, we did something on this recently. Well, we, last week we did this. We did defaults and remedies. That video is on YouTube for Seems everybody. Seems like yesterday. Okay. What was that? Seems like yesterday. Seems like yesterday. The por- Here's the part that we love. The neighbor does not have this in the body of the contract yeah. uh, the portion of the deposit if any paid to listing broker upon default by buyer shall be split equally between listing broker and cooperating broker um, I, nice really, I i like that that's in there because it protects the buyer's agent who didn't yeah. do anything to deserve otherwise yeah. you know they didn't let this deal fall apart the buyer just right. defaulted so i i do like that form in there um dispute dispute resolution we went over that last week uh, we've got title issues, title exam. We're not going to overthink this because we're just drafting a contract and trying to get our offer out there. Here's the biggie. Time is of the essence for the contract. Everything, not just closing. Not just closing. So deposits and huge. inspection issues and uh, all those items are huge. You don't have to put the buy or the seller on notice. You can just put them in default. Yep. So um, we had a deal like this recently where the buyer just never made their second deposit. And the buyer's asked me, all right, what do we do? What do we do? And I said, we have to give them notice that they're in default because it was a neighbor contract. 
And then we can decide whether we want to terminate them or not, whether we want to put them in default, you know, permanently. And so, at, you know, the buyer really liked that. And, and that this, you wouldn't even need to do that. You would just be able to skip right to the front of the line. You are out of contract. You're in default. Moving on. Selling to somebody else. So here's the uh, the next section, Dad, which is the um force majeure language for 30 days versus enable which is you know various subcategories yeah so we went over this a lot unfortunately we had to last year when hurricane ian came through um, yeah. but basically if such force majeure event continues to prevent performance under this contract more than 30 days beyond the closing date then either party may terminate this contract by delivering written notice to the other and the deposit shall be refunded to the buyer. So what we saw a lot in Hurricane Ian issues is, all right, everything's getting delayed. We can't get insurance. Repairs are a disaster. The title companies aren't open. No lender will touch it. And we say, all right, well, let's let's see how long this goes. And if it went for more, if the delays were more than 30 days, then either buyer or seller could terminate. And what it did is it forced the buyer and seller to come back to the table and say, look, is this sustainable or are we just going to let it walk away? Um, yeah. And, you know, maybe there were price reductions, maybe there were extensions granted. Um, but generally, this is this is really clear, easy language. Dad, you and I like this. It can mean anything. Hurricanes, floods, extreme weather, earthquakes, fires. Um, you know, and that really plays a big role when we do have that issue. All right. Oh, I got to clear that. Um, closing documents, escrow procedure, prorations, pretty straightforward. Access to the property. Seller shall, see if I can, oh, wrong one. Seller shall, upon reasonable notice, provide utility service and access to the property for appraisals and inspections, including walkthroughs or follow up walkthrough if necessary. This is great language when someone's trying to refuse access. Hey, you said it was a cash deal. You know, this is cash. You're not supposed to have an appraiser mm -hmm. in here. Well, section L here doesn't say anything about whether there's a financing contingency. They just say you have the right to do an appraisal. You just yeah. have to be reasonable. Neighbor has Favorite something word. to do, Christian. Yeah, Neighbor has a very similar thing. The only thing Neighbor doesn't necessarily discuss uh, that I'm aware of is the follow-up. I think it's, I think it would make sense that a follow-up's included, but this one spells it out, which I yeah. like. The only follow-up they got is for after a storm. Um, the risk of loss language in here is a little different, but again, it's not really relevant for putting a deal together. It's something that the buyer should read, the seller should read. Um, and if something were to happen, then we can go to it. But it's, it's usually we don't even touch those things. Um, we did a video maybe two weeks ago on 1031 exchanges. It's not, it is in the contract. There's nothing you need to do to add to yeah. it. It's in both contracts, so you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to worry about it. Corrupt is a little different, but um, you know the, the, the buyer doesn't have to hold money in escrow if the seller is yeah. a withholding certificate if the IRS hasn't responded. So someone asks, uh, what about measuring a room? Some buyers think they can have access as much as they want. Yeah, it's true. It's it's all about being reasonable. And the buyer has to be reasonable too. Um, the key, when, when we're faced with those kind of issues, it's just like, let's go to the contract. Let's see what that says. Are we still being reasonable? Um, yeah. We actually, that same transaction that the buyer didn't make their second deposit there was an argument that the buyer's attorney was making that the seller wasn't reasonable in allowing access to the property. Well, I don't know how they define reasonable, but in this scenario, it was a seven day inspection. The buyer did two home inspections, a mold test and a radon test in seven days. So I think the seller was more than reasonable, more than accommodating. Um, this, the buyer just didn't like what they found. So that was, you know, it's, but those reasonable terms are always something we can fight over, right? Like good faith, you know, what does that mean? What does that mean? Exactly. Uh, yep. So you got your FERPTA withholding, you know, you would consider there is a uh, FERPTA. Comprehensive riders. Here, here are all your riders, but you, you might have a Can't FERPTA a um, affidavit if you were, if you were doing something with FERPTA, if you had a seller that was foreign. So we've got all our riders, you, just like Nabor again. So you pick the ones that are relevant to you. This is a great 
um, screenshot in the sense that it can guide you to including the language that you need, the forms that you need. I mean, right at the top here, Condo Rider and Homeowners Association. Those, let's go check those out. What are those? You know, because maybe they're different than how Nabor does it. Well, maybe we should look at it. Um, obviously, seller financing, pretty self-explanatory. Um, if there's an FHA or VA financing, there's actually an addendum for that which Nabor does not have. So you, you'll definitely right. want to include that. You may want some sort of homeowners or flood insurance rider in there. You do have a mold on inspection, uh, mold inspection in there that you can take advantage of. Um, if you were in Miami, there is a special uh, tax district uh, disclosure for that. So you could always look there as well. All right. Um, Here's the thing, Dad. I don't know if you and I have ever talked about it. Seller uh -huh. attorney approval or buyer attorney approval. What we, would you uh, say? Maybe, uh, you what's know, the we, percentage of deals that have those included, and should it be lower? I don't see many. Uh, I, I do know Nabor has uh, the seller advisor, the buyer advisor, and you know it's essentially the same thing. Um, I can, I mean, it's, I, it's I, very I, low. Yeah, we, if, there's probably know, a half a dozen every year that we see. Yeah, it's, it's, it's and very, I think it could be zero. I, I had one maybe a week ago where they were trying to get this lady up in Connecticut to sign. And I suggested this because she wanted her Connecticut lawyer to look at it. It's the only way she'd sign the contract. So, you know, Well, we're, so we're my rare. thinking on a neighbor contract... In your scenario, Dad, was that the buyer or the seller? The seller. It was, it was an elderly lady in Connecticut, and up there, everybody has their lawyer look at it. So from a seller's perspective, I get it. If you don't have that seller attorney review period, um, yeah. there's no other way to get out of the contract. You know, you might be able to find some loophole, but generally, if, if you buyer, want to be able to accept and lock that buyer in before you lose them, but you still need two days just to make sure it's a fair deal, I, I think that's great. But for yeah. buyers, I don't like it. Um, I think you could use an as-is contract instead. Um, I think that if it's a condo, you have a condo review period anyways. And then if you're a neighbor, you're not, you're not really held to anything until you put your first deposit down anyways. Right. Um, I suppose in the very limited circumstance that you can't do a far bar as-is contract and you're not in town and you just want to put your eyes on it, I can understand a two or three day contingency for a buyer review. I, I, I can understand that. I don't see it for anything else. The, the, was one, I the opinionated one, no, about that? Hmm. No. no. The one thing I would hit heavily on, though, is you have to have comprehensive A or B if you have a condo or an HOA. You know, neighbor, it's already in the contract, the required disclosure language. It's not already in the far bar contract. So if you forget it, and we've had deals have problems because of that. Yeah, it makes it avoidable by the buyer, which is yes. not good leverage. It's the opposite of good leverage. So this is the homeowners association. Uh, it's very different from the neighbor homeowners association disclosure. Um, the first page is the same. Actually, you'll notice the first page is, is taken directly from the statute. You put in the name of the HOA, let's say it's Laley, Laley Masters Association, you put that in right. there, you're going to put information regarding the current assessments. So if it's a thousand dollars a quarter, uh, and then any current special assessments, remember, the, the far bar contract doesn't specify how to do this otherwise. So you, this it language right has to be statute. There. This is statute based. And if it's not provided in advance, then the buyer will have a three day review period. So if if you were to disclose this the day after you went on effective, well, now the buyer has three days to review, um, you know, free look. So HOA definitely include that. Now, this is where it gets different. The far bar HOA rider has a second page. And I think it has a, no, just the second, not no third page. Um, so this is important for whether the homeowner would need to be approved or not. Um, I did have someone this year who got um, denied. So it was really important and they didn't include this form. So the buyer, you know, buyer was able to walk away 
Um, and they may have been able to otherwise, but they um, they didn't apply in time, which is why they got denied. So it, it took away a lot of leverage that the seller would have had otherwise. Uh, payment of fees, there's more information in addition to Florida statutes that they're asking you to include. So that might be transfer fees, or it could be a capital contribution, something like that. And you would put that in there uh, in addition. You uh, special you can pay assessments after the closing the buyer can pay the assessment payments after closing and the seller can pay them before which closing. we like and that can match up to what you yeah. have in the body of the contract as well and right. then um, we always like to have the contact people in there so that the buyer can immediately reach out and get more information and then let's go back the condo association one is actually very similar and this form uh, let's see condo writer I like the condo one if I'm a buyer. Let's see, I think it's this one. I like this for a buyer as well. And the reason I like it, and I assume it's probably the same reason you like it, yeah. is that it actually has fees included. Well, and it talks about uh, special assessments that have been on the agenda in the last 12 months. 12 yeah. months, yeah. So it's it's it requires the seller to give a lot more information than the statute yeah. or neighbor would otherwise require. <laughs> So they've again, they've got whether it's a approval is required, um, right of first refusals by the association. Um, we've got fees and assessments. Remember on Nabor, they don't have any of this information. And then here's the additional information and also this part, which is statutorily required to be included in the contract. So that has to be in there. And then here is um, important part I like if you had a buyer that already lived in the association, well, maybe they do not request a current copy of the documents. And now that condo review requirement has been removed. I think that's kind of interesting. Sometimes that might even get you the deal where you don't, you're saying, I don't even need the review period. We're good. Um, or I don't need the documents at least. So that means their three days would start immediately. Um, and then buyer received the documents described in paragraph five above. What I really like about this part is that it assumes that you've already provided it to the buyer, which is exactly how we should be doing it. I yeah. think that's great. Um, I don't think you should wait until you have a contract to give all the documents. Give it the day before. Give it the week before. Um, common elements. It has inspections and repairs. Structural integrity reserve study. I think a lot's going to happen with that over the next several months. Um, so that's really interesting as well. Oof, that was a lot of stuff. We've got some, when it comes to a condo and HOA documents, whose duty is it to get the documents to the buyer for review? So remember, there's a very big uh, distinction with a condo, you, you're required to get those documents over. Um, and the far bar rider would include more things like fees and uh, meeting minutes and all that. And in NABOR, it's really just the covenants, the governance form, bylaws, rules and regulations, financials. I'm probably missing others. But usually, I mean, ultimately, it's the seller's responsibility, but they're going to ask the listing agent to do it for them. Or you're going to be one driving the train a little bit. Um, and so you want to confirm receipt that the buyer got it. This is a very timely question because um, I actually had someone who the listing agent gave the documents to the lender, but didn't give them to the agent and never got receipt that the buyer received them. And so the buyer just terminated. And I think they ended up firing their agent and kind of making them, you know, the reason for all of it falling apart, which we, we all know that's not why it fell apart. It probably yeah. fell apart from a million other reasons, but they, they could point a finger and say, you did this. You didn't, you know, you didn't protect me. But dad, do you, you know, is, how do you we have handle, a neighbor? How this, do you handle getting receipt? Because obviously the statute says that the buyer has to get actual receipt, that no one can receive it on their behalf. Although the problem is with both neighbor and Farbar, receipt, you, you got to give the documents to the selling agent. And receipt by the selling agent specifically is not considered receipt by the buyer. So yeah. you have to give the selling agent appropriate time to give it to his client. Now, if his client's on vacation somewhere, it might take, you know, three or four days to get it to, you know, Cape Cod or wherever the buyer is. And then the buyer is going to go through it and see if they're complete. A lot of times they're not complete. So, 
you know, the realtor, the selling agent has a duty to turn it over as quickly as possible, but as quickly as possible depends upon where the heck the buyer is. So you, you want confirmation that the buyer got it, you know, and you, and, but you have to know where the heck the buyer is. Yeah. So what, what I would love in that scenario, the way, way we can avoid all of it is you get the buyer to sign the rider or you, or if your neighbor, you right. get to sign the, um, the neighbor receipt prior or together with the contract. Yeah, I, I oh. tell real because the, the the selling agent can't sit on it for a week. There's no reason on the planet, but it might be a day or two before they can get their buyer to receive the documents, especially if they're in another state. Yep. You know, yep. FedEx Absolutely. Or email. Well, there, there's a lot of other forms. There's a there's a million other ways that you can do these contracts. But if yep. we were to summarize uh, our thinking on the Farbar contract, it's really not that scary. There are a couple of things that we think of, like the financing contingency or um, the repairs. Those things can really, um, you know, change course on a deal if you're not paying attention. You know, the the inspection period where it doesn't have an election period that can change course. Yeah. But it's it's not something you need to overthink when doing your contract. This is something that you'll learn the next day when we go over it. So. Use this as hopefully a confidence builder, grab a file, put the contract together, send it to us. We'll do a cursory review. We'll, hey, you, what about this? Or, um, and, and realize that if it's a cash deal, well, we just made the deal even simpler. You know, put it as a cash contract. We, we can decipher it real well for you. It's just, you know, like half a dozen high points and you can make your offer and exactly. hopefully get accepted. Don't be intimidated by it. Feel confident that if you're going into Lee County, or Miami, or wherever it is that you can put one of these together, just like anybody else. And if you need us to help or supplement some of the things that you've learned, please reach out. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. It was another good turnout. And uh, hopefully we'll see you next week. Same time. Thanks. Take care.